Hello and welcome to another episode of the Speak the Truth podcast. Today's episode is being sponsored by Prize Picks. Today we brought back Jeff Fisher. Jeff is a retired U.S. Air Force Colonel and he's also a contributor to the Kiev Post. Now, Jeff is an international security expert. He has written articles for BBC and The Hill. He's also been on two international boards. In addition to all that, Jeff is also an accomplished author and you can find his books right over on Amazon. They'll be linked down in the description below in case you want to check them out later. All right. So I got to say, Jeff, it is great to have you back on the show. Uh, it's it's good to be back with you. And, and uh, you know, I I checked in uh, on the last one and I went down and scrolled through the comments and it seems like you have, well, number one, you have an amazing following, right? So, uh, yeah. so you're doing good things. Uh, and the other one is, uh, it was, it was clear that, that your following wanted me to be back. So I wasn't, I wasn't shocked to receive your email. <laughs> <laughs> no, they absolutely love you. And like, they love having you on and they, they truthfully really value your insight. Thanks. It's great. It's great to hear. So today it looks like you had a new article that got posted to the Kiev Post. Yeah, yeah. So I wrote a. Uh, I, I get a little outside of my uh, my wheelhouse. Usually, I'm talking about F-16s and and what air power and air domain would mean. And I, I kind of kind of jumped into my diplomatic hat, right? So I was uh, I was an arms control expert for three years while I was in Vienna uh, under the U.S. Embassy there. And um, you know, I, I started thinking, okay, if we don't, if we choose not to help Ukraine, if the ad administration chooses to to stay with this current line of, you know, we're we're, we're kind of helping, but we're not really helping. Um, what, what, what could the ramifications long term be? And I, I realize short term that the ramification is we'd save 60 million, 60 billion, excuse me, right? We'd save 60 billion in the short term. And that that's fair, right? I mean, we are heavily in debt, you know, trillions of dollars in debt. So I, I understand right. when people say, hey, I, I don't want to help Ukraine. I want to help the United States. And I, I OK, I, I got that. Right. So let's let's talk about what it means if the United States can't help Ukraine, right? And I think that there's two big takeaways that the, that the world, and I'm not just talking about Americans, I'm talking, if you're a sovereign leader of one of the 50, 150 plus nations out there, what's your takeaway right now? And I think your takeaway is that the United States and, and, and basically the Western part of Europe uh, is truly not committed to the alliances and the security agreements that it created and crafted uh, when it's dealing with someone who's a nuclear power. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the first one. And the second one is if you are a nuclear power, your sovereignty is almost assured, like no one's going to mess with you. And these two key takeaways are scary, right? Because in 1968, you know, one of the biggest hallmark and landmark pieces of, of treaty diplomacy that the world had seen was this non-proliferation agreement of a nuclear non-proliferation agreement where right. we had five nations who had nukes only these nations would have them there were some nefarious actors out there that that went and did get nukes behind the back so we're at the nuclear nine right now maybe 10 depending on where iran is but still it's you know it's still manageable right if if that treaty were abolished and basically said i'm not following this treaty anymore i i, I realize the value of having nukes i'm gonna go get a, a nuke so i need one right i just need one it's all you uh, need. I, I would tell you yeah i just i just need one um, I, I think it's going to be a very scary world in about five to 10 years. And it, it, it was hard enough being an arms expert, like an arms control and a, a, an arm expert when nine nations had nukes. I, I can't even imagine what three or four dozen out there mm. have nukes and are rotating leaders through. And you end up with leaders like the leader of Iran or the leader of you know, some people don't like Erdogan right now in Turkey, or they don't like mm -hmm. Orban in Hungary. And w what would a nuclear Orban, a nuclear Erdogan, or a nuclear Putin? I think we know what that one is, right? right. What does this mean? So, so that's kind of what the article is about. You and like you said, you find it in the Kiev Post. Now, I was looking through it, and in part of it, you talked about uh, the Budapest Memorandum and specifically how it kind of ties into the Nuclear Proliferation Treaty. Is kind of how I read it. Now, the Budapest Memorandum is what? It's a total of six paragraphs, I think, in total. It's, it's really not that long. And a lot of people it's need to- It's one page. It's one right, page. A lot right, of people yeah. need to go read it. It's, yeah. it's not that big. And you'd mentioned right. about the security guarantees that are you know, like kind of given within there. Um, the way I read it, though, wasn't so much that we promised to be backing up Ukraine on anything. It was essentially, we're going to recognize the sovereignty of their borders. And if anything in there happened to be violated, that we had the right to basically- talk about it and determine what our way forward would be with that. And I feel like we've met every measure of the Budapest memorandum um, kind of as it reads. Sure. So this is an interesting discussion when you, when you get inside the halls of the Truman building at, at, at state department, right? Cause there are some people who read it uh, and they basically say, Hey, look, we, we made an agreement, right? We, we, 
we made an agreement. It, it, maybe it, it's in between the words, but the Ukrainians clearly took away this, hey, we're going to give up our nukes because that's that's part of the paragraphs, right? Mm -hmm. The first step of the Budapest Memorandum was we are going to surrender all of our nuclear capability. Uh, Russia will get all those nuclear weapons. The U.S. didn't get any. The U.K. didn't get any. Right? They all went to Russia. But you guys will never attack us. And and by the way, Russia is a signator of this agreement. Right? So so Vladimir Putin's predecessors at the at the executive most level, right? That the president of Russia signed this agreement. And said they exist. so. There's this expectation that like you will recognize our borders forever. If I if I recall the Budapest Memorandum correct, it actually says if this is ever violated, we would bring it up and we would discuss it at the UN Security Council correct. as a violation, right? Right. And we did that. Unfortunately, the security the UN Security Council has be has has really become a, a travesty since 1994 when the Budapest Memorandum was written. Mm -hmm. So now you've got you know you've probably got a lot of Ukrainians who feel like they got burned. I mean, th you're right. They're maybe not reading the exact word for word of the Budapest Memorandum, but there was an expectation that someone would step in and, and protect them. Ironically, that the really weird piece of the Budapest Memorandum was the expectation was it was going to be Russia to come in and protect them because the the because they had again the expectation not was to mess with the border. Yeah, and the expectation was going to be the United States, or it was going to be NATO, or it was going to be the UK that came in and basically from the from the West and took away Ukraine, right? And that was Mother Russia, who was their closest closest friend back in 1984, that was going to be the one to defend them. Uh, oh, how times have changed, right? Right. And, and yeah, and and now you've got you know your friend, your 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 allies become your enemy, uh, which is really unfortunate. So. So the expectation of, like I said, the expectation of the security agreement is not being met as far as Ukraine is being said. And look, we, we could have a debate all day long on whether or not it truly does mean what the United States wants or not. Oh, OK, and you might win that debate. There, there's no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. But you and I debating it as Americans are very different than Ukrainians debating sure. it. Sure. Or, or even, even more important, any other national leader out there who said, look, I understand the Ukrainians had, an, had a belief – that there was some kind of security agreement out there. They didn't have it. The U.S. isn't stepping up, nor is the U.K., who also signed that document. Uh, and and NATO is is in shambles. Uh, we need a nuke. <laughs> that, that's Gosh. that's that, that's the the outcome. Yeah. Yeah. I, like Ukraine getting a nuke. I, like the whole idea is just. I, I, ooh. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't even don't even want to go there in my brain right now. But they, I mean, they would be a long way off from that, regardless. Now. So, mm -hmm. I mean, they have they have nuclear power plants. So, so let's be careful. They have nuclear power plants. They could easily make yellow cake fairly easy. They, okay. they could have a bomb. They could have bomb within five years. I, I would. And this is where I get back to the money thing. Right. So I I, I don't dismiss 60 billion dollars is a lot of money. <laughs> I would love to have 60 billion dollars personally. Um, but if you th if, if people who don't want to support Ukraine right now think 60 billion is a lot. There's only one way the United States and the West is going to placate these nations who want nuclear weapons. And that is to give them money or aid. And, and it's $60 billion to one country. But if you're trying to stop 150 nations from getting nuclear weapons, mm -hmm. that's a whole nother level of billions on into the trillions. I mean, just imagine – I mean, and we know this, right? Because we know how much the Biden administration and the Obama administration gave to Iran to try and stop Iran. And that didn't even work. Right. So we're talking about significant amounts of money. So – Interesting that you're bringing up money and how Americans are concerned with it. One of the things that like I've been talking to my viewers about lately has to do with um, BRICS and how that can impact the United States dollar. And the more Russia continues on in this war in Ukraine, if anything resembling a victory for Putin comes out of this, it's going to basically give him more leverage in, on the world stage. And BRICS had multiple more countries join in January of 2024. And some of those countries actually have the ability to control about 12% of, of world trade uh, via the Suez Canal. And so if any of those countries decide to stop trading in the US dollar and do it in local currency, <clears throat> or if BRICS develops its own currency, the US dollar is going to get hurt bad. And not because of BRICS alone, but because the US dollar has already been weakening and weakening and weakening. It could be the tipping point that really drives the U.S. into a depression. Yeah, I, I worry more about China. When we talk about BRICS, right, I, I, I worry a little bit more about China's influence in, the, in that acronym than I do about Russia, right? And, and that being said, I, 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 I watched painstakingly 
how, how the European Union works, right? Mm-hmm. And and this is a group of, for the most part, Anglo-Saxons and Europeans that have been on the European continent for a very long time, who are, who are mostly like-minded with a relatively common financial system, common religion bases, you know, and, and they don't get along. Like, well, right. so sometimes when I look at the dichotomies that are bricks, I'm like, oh my God, this is, it's a hot chocolate mess. Um, does po- money really trump all when it goes into bricks? I don't know the answer to that, but I, I don't dismiss your point, right? I mean, that China has this leverage to the gills on, on national debt. And, um, and, and that's, that's a, that's a concerning thing, right? It's an insane amount of money, like 950 billion or something around in that neighborhood, I believe yeah. Yeah. that we owe to them. Yeah. It's, it's nuts. Um, yeah. So in December of 2023, our last arms shipment went into Ukraine. That's when all of our money dried up going in there. Now, prior to that, Russia was reading the writing on the wall and they actually started ramping up their attacks on the Ukrainians. I mean, Ukrainian positions and have recently in February had success in cities like Adivka and, and places like that along the front lines mm-hmm. to where it wasn't necessarily a collapse line. Ukraine withdrew and in other places were seeing small territorial gains by Russia, but it didn't come at zero cost. As a matter of fact, some of the estimates that have been released by the UK and other nations are saying that Russia over the last several months have been averaging between 900 to 1,000 deaths a day inside of Ukraine. Do you feel like those numbers are in any way remotely accurate? Because that actually brings, I did the math, and if you add it up, it brings the total up to over 115,000 Russian deaths just in the last four months, if you were to believe that UK estimate. Yeah, so there's a lot to unpack in, in that statement, right? So the first thing is, I think that I, I don't know if if Russia issues their soldiers uh, flak vests that are just basically made of magnets, right? Because sure. these guys are they're bullet catchers, right? I, and and as much as I I sometimes realize people take a gas at uh, or are aghast at estimates that the UK puts out like that. I look back in history and I don't think there's a time where I can ever say the Russian government or the Russian leader mentality truly cared about trying to save lives over territory. Right. Right. So, so uh, in world war two, they certainly didn't, they didn't care. Right. It was all about winning. And and if they had to throw 20 million at the, at the war, they're 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 going to do it. Their numbers in world war two are insane. Yeah. They're, they're insane. Right. I completely agree. But, but I want to go back to your initial, your opening comments, like when you said in December, you know, the USA and, the, and money dried up. Um, but, but the truth is it didn't, right? Um, okay. And I don't mean that we've given any more. I just, I, I think context matters, right? And I, I, I want people, I want, I want listeners to understand this. In December, Joe Biden, uh, his, his uh, national security spokesperson, his White House spokesperson all said, this all lies on the hands of the Republicans now. Right. I don't have any more money to give as a president. I'm impotent. I have no I have nothing left in my sleeves. Right. But the truth of the matter was he had four point two billion dollars in presidential drawdown authority to give that he's sitting on. He's still sitting on to this day. Right. And and Congress now actually has come out and said, hey, your bluff to Congress didn't work. (laughs) Like we know you have four point two billion. Now, in Joe Biden's defense, I will point out that the other money that they use for presidential drawdown authority was matched by congressional funding that bought back what he drew down. Mm -hmm. He still has complete authority to assume risk and draw down whatever he wants in the Defense Department. There are certain articles that he can't, but he can draw down what he chooses and give it to Ukraine without an immediate backfill. Congress will eventually pass a defense budget. I, I, they, they, they've done it every year, right? right? Whether it's a continuing resolution or whatever, the Congress will pass a defense budget. I'm not, not worried about that, right? So this notion where he's like, he doesn't want to assume the risk because he's not sure when or how things are going to be backfilled. Well, okay, fair, but but I'm a, I'm a big picture guy, right? Our, our, our defense department is kind of prepared for a two main theater war, right? How do we fight China and how do we fight Russia at the same time? I don't know if we can. Well, based on what I'm seeing out of Russia, <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking we could take our feet off the gas a little bit, right? Sure. I, I think Russia's not as 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 big of a bear as we want. I think it's more of a paper tiger than a bear. So maybe a little bit of risk in PDA is warranted if it could help Ukraine. And this goes all the way back. And I wanted to point that out to your, to your listeners, not to kind of call you out, but just for people to understand that the United States, Joe Biden is not really doing everything that he can for Ukraine. It is very, very clear that he's not. Um, I think you saw one of my posts on on X or Twitter or whatever we're calling it this week, right? Mm-hmm. 
where I said in the boneyard, there's 366 F-16s that are wrapped up and basically preserved. All of those can't go. I'm not stupid. I know we can't give 366, but we, I do know from, from very senior people in the Pentagon that we could easily make two squadrons, right? Sure. Which is roughly about 50 airplanes. So we could basically, if, if, if Joe Biden shows, he could give, he could double the number of F-16s that would be going uh, to, and, he, and those were there, by the way, at the beginning of the war. So the fact that he didn't do it at the beginning and he still hasn't done, I, I think it speaks volumes at the at what testicular fortitude Joe Biden has at supporting Ukraine. And I mean, that's a very valid point that he has, like the discretion to do that. And the artillery shells that everybody keeps wanting to talk about, you know, they're only about 2000 bucks a pop on average. You know, like now they, they flex between like two to 4K, two to 5K, depending on where they're getting them from, but about two yeah. grand a pop. So his money would go a long way as far as that goes. Yeah, 100%. Can't, can't argue with you. you you're yeah. right. And when I, when I also take a dive and I start looking mm. into it, right, because it's not just that, the, the F-16s that you talked about, it also has to, like, we have lots of stuff sitting out in a boneyard, whether it's old APCs, tanks, whatever have you, that you could also piecemeal together and ship that over there as well. I was stationed in Tucson for seven years. I drove by the boneyard every day going to work, right, and on the way back. And, I, and it, it is a... It, it, at one point, it was the fifth largest air force, air force in the world just by itself. <laughs> just, just the airplanes that we, were, we just had in, in shrink wrap were the fifth largest air force by themselves. That's insane. So <laughs> the one thing that I like to go back a little bit, like in the discussion, as far as the Russian attrition rate goes, let's say that attrition mm -hmm. rate wasn't that high. I think we'd be seeing a lot better effects on the ground from the Russians if they still had all of that manpower capable. So estimated right now around 400,000 Russian troops inside of Ukraine. And that would mean that they lost about 25% of their force. Now they wouldn't lose all of that, you know, even <clears> across <throat> the board, you'd have some units completely wiped out, but a good chunk of them would be combat ineffective. And I read a really interesting uh, post the other day uh, that was talking about, uh, it, it came from a Russian that was up on the front line outside of Adivka. And what he was saying was in one of their last assaults over the last week, they did not have artillery support by any means. And that's a whole other subject that I want to talk to you about briefly. But I, I think the Russians are pretty weak. And so if we were able to give Ukraine the stuff that they need up front, I don't think Ukraine would have the ability to advance right now. I think they got to recoup and reorganize quite a bit, but they would definitely be able to hold the Russians in place. I think beyond the shadow of a doubt, with the proper support, they'd be able to hold the Russians back. Yeah, there, there's a lot... Um there's a significant amount of churn going on and what's going on in this. And um, I, I, I try and stay away from conspiracy theories. I told you guys that last time, right? No matter how much they try and bite me at the, at the end, I'm like, Hey, yeah. you know, I, I, I um, and I would say that I agree. If Ukraine had the capacity to launch a counteroffensive, and I'm not saying they do, but my God, now would be a wonderful time, right? The if, if we compare it to what they tried for a counteroffensive last time, right? They they telegraphed it. They told mm -hmm. them, you know, they talked about it for months. They gave the Russians a ridiculous amount of time to landmine after landmine, you know, three three layers deeps of landmine and trenches and and defensive positions, and it, and of course it, it didn't work. You have a situation right now where the Russians are are rubber banding, right? That the, mm -hmm. the battle space in that forward line is rubber banding, and it's really hard to set defensive positions in in a in a in a battle line that's moving, right? Because right. you got to pick them up and move them, right? So if you've got the Russians kind of even coming at you, if you can launch this counterattack, you've you've almost could break a hole and get through, and then get behind all these other defenses along that entire line of contact. And, and then push through. I realize that is a massive conspiracy theory, and I want to put the little asterisks up here in the corner of the screen, right? And say, yeah, yeah say this like is to call them tinfoil yeah. hat moments. Yeah. Okay, there you, there you go. Perfect, yeah. So, yeah, I just want to make sure that everyone's aware of that. All right, good. Yeah, and I, you know, and I also don't think that, like, the Russians, or I'm sorry, the Ukrainians really have the ability, if they were to go through, it's a manpower issue. It's not, like, a question of if they if they want to, but it's a manpower issue. I don't think I have enough manpower to be able to, even if they punch a hole in or they do anything like that, to properly secure because the deeper and deeper they go, the more troops they have to drop off to secure more and more of the terrain. And so essentially yeah. as they punch through and open it up, you're going to need more ground troops to take care of that. Yep. Yeah. And troops are an issue. Both sides. Yeah. Now, the F-16s, we've got 
best guess, like earliest to come on station up on the front line about 30 days out, if, if we're being optimistic. With the current situation on the ground in Ukraine with a shortage of supplies, but Russia also knows that F-16s might be coming on station sometime soon. Do you think that Russia is going to continue to push, just assuming that they do have those current troop losses, do you think that they're going to continue to push knowing that eventually this funding is going to get passed? Everything that we're seeing with the uh, you know, uh, Czech Republic, you know, trying to fund what is 800,000 rounds and so on and so forth. But knowing that ammunition is going to be coming in soon and knowing the F-16s might come on station, do you think Russia is going to continue to push uh, with everything going on, just continuing to throw people into the grinder? Uh, I don't. I think if you're Russia and you have, and I think Russia has far better intelligence of when the F-16s are going to arrive, right? I think that sure. it wouldn't be surprised me if they've got, you know, guys sitting outside of all the countries F-16 pilots are training in and going to the bars and just trying to figure out when these guys are going, right, or, or mm-hmm. what they're doing. So I, I, I think we could speculate, but I think the Russians probably have a better answer on that. Um, I, I think what you're what you're going to see and what you technically are kind of seeing, right, is I think Ukraine does believe or at least hopes the F-16 is going to have a significant impact in the battle space. I think they believe that, right? I'm not saying they're right or wrong. I think they're right, but debate for another day. I, I think you're seeing Ukraine doing things to prep the battle space for the F-16s coming in. I think these A-50, uh, the second A-50 loss is significant because it's trying to take away those eyes and ears that would be given right. uh, uh, Russian fighters uh, intelligence and surveillance and reconnaissance on what was out there. I'm not saying that all the Su-34s that Ukraine's claimed to, to shoot down are all kills, but I think there's a good number of those are probably pretty real because you want to try and clean up that airspace. Sure. If I was a ground-based air defense operator in Russia, I'd be, I'd be a little hesitant right now to be turning on my radar and hanging out in the battle space. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think those are all prepped for the battle space. I, I also think you're going to see what Russia did. Uh, sad, sadly, I think you're going to see Ukraine do, do what they did last time. They're going to talk about the F-16 is going to come in. They're going to telegraph their punch. They're going to, you know, they're going to say they're coming, they're coming, they're coming. And as soon as they do that, they're going to give Russia the chance to bed down, hunker down, build defensive lines, you know, dig, 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 get in the ground, get under underneath any of these JDAMs or ordinances that are falling, try and save as many guys, uh, and then kind of live through that attack wave, right. and then and then lift your head back up again. And and um, I'd like to say I'm wrong, but I, I've already seen the show once last summer, right? So, so I've seen this movie. Yeah. So Singapore. Singapore, okay. <laughs> you know where I'm going with this question, it sounds like. <laughs> you just you just jumped continents on me. It's all right. I'm, I'm hanging with you. Well, we, we're not changing continents because Singapore has acquired multiple F-35s over the years from Lockheed, and they're looking at purchasing some more. And in one of their parliamentary mm-hmm. meetings the other day, they actually said that the United States has been offering F-35s, providing intelligence to uh, NATO Um on intelligence collection from inside of Ukraine from the F-35. So I, I started looking into it and F-35, um, it's got the ability to collect all the way up to like 350 kilometers out, about 350 clicks out. They can actually like pull and gather. So they technically don't even have to be over Ukrainian airspace in order to make that happen. And that's kind of how I interpreted that. Are you, are you familiar with that situation? F-35 can do a lot of things. Right. That's yeah. so, so without me going to jail, this is what I would tell you about the F-35. <laughs> This, this is this is the difference between like an F-16 and F-35. The F-35 is its own sensor shooter, right? And when we talk about sensors and shooters, um, and we talk about some of the things that the F-35 to do, uh, it's akin to having human eyes, having snake eyes or snake sensors from heat. It's akin to having other animal type of vision, so other spectral ways to see an image and since it's all coming from one platform, or even more importantly, from multiple platforms that can talk, right? It's a sensor shooter that literally can fuse intelligence damn near real time, mm-hmm. n- not just a radar, not just a human eye, but all these other things that I can't, other sure. animals in, in the zoo, right? Sure. <laughs> that, that have different ways to see things. Um, and all of that is being fused not only onto one platform, but as the platform's talking into a link, you know, you're familiar with the term of line of bearing, right? If, if mm-hmm. I have a, if, if an electronic uh, reconnaissance location, I take one line of bearing and I say, I know on this line somewhere, somewhere from here to infinity, right. there's a Russian radar that's operating at this frequency. That's great. Sure. It doesn't tell me where on the line. 
I just, no, you have to I just know it's on the line. Right. Right. But if I if I have multiple other stations out there and we're all taking this and we're all shooting lines of bearing, we get a fix. Right. So we have we have a rough idea or an ellipse basically is around saying somewhere on here. If you have a bunch of them talking real time, you can actually immediately get a fix. That's the same thing that, that an F-35 can do in the air with its data link systems and stuff like that. So. So, yes, I, I would say that could the F-35s be doing that? Sure. I, I, that, that, that doesn't surprise me at all. The F-35 was always touted to be uh, a sensor more than a shooter. Uh, when, when I talk about, and look, I'm a, I'm a conservative, I'm a, I'm a conservative by, by trade and tradition. I just, I can't pay $8 a gallon for gasoline in Europe. It just drives me insane. Sure. So I drive a Tesla, right? So I'm sorry. I drive a Tesla. Congratulations <laughs> to Elon Musk. Good on you. But you know, for me, for me, a Tesla, it basically is, it's not a car, right? You're making a huge mistake when you call a Tesla, just a car. It, it, it's not an F-35 is not just a fighter. Th those are very similar mistakes. Hope you, ladies and gentlemen, are enjoying this episode with Colonel Fisher. Let me tell you something. Football season may be over, but the action on the floor is just now heating up. Whether it's a tournament season or fight for the playoff home court, there is no shortage of high stakes basketball moments this time of year. Ladies and gentlemen, get in on the excitement with Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app where you can turn your hoops knowledge into serious cash. Conference tournaments are here, which means the biggest moments in college basketball are getting closer. Be part of the action on prize picks for both men and women's college basketball. Quick withdrawals, easy gameplay, and an enormous selection of players and stat types are what makes prize picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Now me, I love prize picks because it's simple to use and they even offer insurance. I'm a busy guy, as you all know. I hate adding credit card information every time I want to throw down. Prize Picks solved that and made all of our lives easier by adding Apple Pay. I'm also a little risk adverse when it comes to money myself. And my favorite part of Prize Picks is they offer injury insurance. So even if my player gets injured in the first half, it doesn't count against me. Download the app today and use code ROB for a first deposit match up to $100. I'll say it again. Download the app today and use code ROB for a first deposit match up to a hundred dollars. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. That's a it's a pretty interesting point, like a pretty interesting way to put it. Um, as it goes to that, um, did you see that Zelensky actually today got targeted by a Russian airstrike outside of Odessa? Yeah, I, he they missed by a pretty large margin, but I guess he got to see the strike and actually saw some people get killed. Yeah, apparently it was by a couple hundred meters that like it was completely off at. And when I look at that, I'm like, okay, and this goes back to the Russia being a paper tiger deal. You know, if that that is like the number one target for Russia inside of Ukraine to make a mass like on everything. So I could imagine that a strike package like that was just kind of, you know, blessed off to a random human being that, you know, like a, a random theater commander got a hold of it and was like, yeah, let's strike Zelensky, you know, like let's just throw whatever the hell we have at it and call it a day. I feel like that information would have been passed up, you know, and, and, I can't picture the United States missing an airstrike that or most Western nations doing that. Like, what does that tell you about Russia's strike capability? Uh, it confirms a lot. Uh, I've, I watch a lot of the videos, the first, uh, first person FPV video of, of strikes. Right. And, and I would tell you that I think Russia's lancets have gotten better, but if you go back and try and pull all the lancet videos and put them together, I don't know why I've, I've asked numerous people and I haven't gotten a very good answer, but every single Lancet hit, it looks like they're glancing blows. They're mm -hmm. off center. They're not direct hits. And I don't, I mean, you would think it's a first person view. Like, how is it, how, how can you not hit it? You're you driving off? right in on it. Right. Hey, why are you off? And, and they're always these glancing blows. And the other thing I find interesting about a lot of the Russian videos that they use for propaganda where they're showing these strikes is they never show you the follow on. Right. I think right. it's interesting. Ukraine will show you like either guys dismounting the vehicle or the thing on fire for a while. Russia will show you it exploded, but then it stops right there. I'm like, well, I want to know what I, I want to know. Is this is this, you know, mortally damaged? Is sure. it still in operation? Are they going to come tow it away? I, as a, these things matter, right, especially on the, on the ground in the battle space. So. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think Russia's had a long, a long time to not have good precision. Uh, there's a couple there's another good reason for that. Right. So Russia refused initially to to invest in 
uh, the U.S. GPS system. They were going to build their equivalent called GLONASS, right? So they were going to rely on their own global navigation precision and timing system. It was called GLONASS. They're going to put their own satellites in space. Uh, these were going to, you know, these were going to guide their airplanes and guide their munitions. And I think five are operational now. It's it's almost non-functional. Uh, and we saw this along with the the Russian Air Force, right? You'd see their systems and their HUDs up display, but over on the canopy rail would be like a Velcroed Garmin or something, mm -hmm. you know, where they were where they didn't have an integrated navigation system, but they were clearly trying to use Western navigation systems because they weren't relying on their own. So yeah, so yeah, I'm I, not shocking, but yeah, it is what it is. I guess regardless of what the issue is when like it matters, they're not able to strike their target, you know, and that, that would have been a huge W for Russia and they just weren't able to pull it off. It would have. And I think, I think the other thing that we have to look at is not that they, they just missed, but, but dang, they got some pretty good real-time intelligence. That that's the thing that's concerns me if I'm Zelensky, right? Like how did they get that good or real time, fine fix Spanish intelligence to get me? He was with some other foreign leaders and other foreign dignitaries. So you know, there's probably a lot of finger pointing going on between those nations. Like, hey, who who tipped the beans? Because we're not we're not supposed to be talking when we go down there, right? We're not supposed to tell people. So I, I think there's a, there's there's a little need to be cleaning up shop on who's talking where uh, in the Ukrainian military. Yeah. Yeah. How do you see this thing playing out in the end? Like, if you were to speculate, go tinfoil hat for me. How do you see the entire Russia Ukraine conflict ending? Can I go part A, part B? Like, sure. I'll give you two options, right? Yeah. So, so I think after, because we're, I don't know when you're posting this, but we just, Super Tuesday just happened yesterday, right? So I just want to, I want our viewers to understand the context that we're coming at this, right? And, you know, it's clear Donald Trump and, and Joe Biden are going to be the two nominees going forward in, into the, into the general election. Joe Biden has an interesting dilemma facing him, right? And I would tell you that I think there's a lot of people who blame him for the way we left Afghanistan. I, I, I would be one of them. Uh, I, I don't think it was clean. Uh, Likewise. I would think that there's a lot of people that also blame him for where we are in Ukraine. He, he can say it's Congress's fault and Secretary Johnson's fault, but, but the truth is there's just too much information out there. You, you can't be a president and wave off, you know, billions of dollars of student debt and then not, and then tell people, you know, there's war going on and my hands are tied. It just, but it doesn't, and it doesn't not happen. Mention, right. Not to mention, we also talked like he, in the last time we, you know, we were on together, he hasn't given any real guidance on what the U S objective is overall inside Ukraine and right. how he wants to see it yeah. end. Right. So if, so should Joe Biden's either going to have to build a spine and this is my part A. Joe Biden says, look, I'm going all in on Ukraine. It's the it's the key difference that I have with Donald Trump right now, other than the border and some other things. I'm not going to win the border. Right. That That's just not going to happen. I think that the news that just came out with the 350,000 people that he flew in secretly. I don't oh, think yeah. that's, that's going to help. Right. So so he either goes all in. He says, dude. F-16s are coming in 15 days, not 30 days or not this summer. And I'm I'm giving the ones out of the boneyard and we're going to use U.S. manpower and maintainers to actually maintain them in Poland and, and blah, blah, blah. And he's going all he's just putting all his chips on the table. Sure. Right. And I would tell you if that happens, there is hope for Ukraine. I think that the risk then becomes to Joe Biden is what what does what what does escalation look like from the Russian side? So I, I, we can't dismiss that. So that would be good for Ukraine, or Joe Biden is basically just going to hunker down, right? And he's going to basically say, I, I, "I can't. I've never been a war hawk." He was the only guy in the whole uh, Biden administration, or I'm sorry, Obama administration that was opposed to the strike on Bin Laden, right? Mm -hmm. So he's he's never he's never been a war hawk. He can't do it. He's basically going to tuck tail and run. He's gonna he's literally going to obfuscate and blame everyone else and uh and blame the republicans and he's going to go i think into into november with that kind of attitude and if that's the case um you, ukraine's in trouble right I, I think ukraine will have to rely on either europe uh or some other way to continue this fight and and i'm not i'm not sold by the way if donald trump wins that donald Trump just abandons ukraine i, I i'm not i'm not sold on that and he had some very flattering words to actually say about Zelensky just a couple of weeks ago where he said, look, I like I like Zelensky. He was the one guy that actually said, I didn't say this stuff on the phone call. I don't know. Right. I remember that. You know, yeah. He, yeah. Yeah. So 
So I'm not I'm not sold that that's the answer yet, right? Yeah. Now, it, I mean, it's estimated right now that if Ukraine doesn't get enough, like if, if they basically funding doesn't get passed by the EU or the United <clears throat> States or the Czech deal doesn't go through, basically, if they're stuck at where they're at right now, they're going to be out of reserve ammunition by June. And once that information started pouring out, then we started to see uh, the French, I believe, were the first ones, the French president that said he hasn't ruled out putting boots on the ground, maybe not in a direct combat role capacity, but, you know, a support capacity or maybe an advise and assist capacity. He, he basically said everything's on the table. And then following him, <coughs> we had the lists come out. And then there's several other countries that are saying the exact same thing now. So it almost seems like other nations are willing to start committing to this because they don't want to see Russia win. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, and I will tell you, sitting over here in Europe, it's it's fascinating to see, right? I think that the European nations are truly starting to see what the gravitas of war truly means. When you are, when you are a, a leader of a nation, you say, we are committed to a war. No, no one alive today under the age of 60 truly knows what it's like mm -hmm. to be at war. I mean, who, who's had a ration card in the United States? Or, or Europe, for that matter. Right. Who was who was in their village in their town, actually looking up, you know, with the spotlight, looking for bombers over their air, pulling their volunteer time. That you know, that's what it's like to be at war, right? War bonds, war reserves, all these types of things. That people here in, in Europe are starting to wake up. To that. I I don't. I I think it's going to be interesting what European nations do. I don't think you're going to see the Baltic or Poland or or even France boots on the ground in their forms. I think you're going to see some kind of hybrid system where these nations will say, you know what, we're going to, we're going to give you a leave of absence, right? And we're going to, we're going to give you a leave of absence and you can go sign up to fight for another sovereign nation. We won't hold it against you. And oh, by the way, we're not going to pay your salary, but we're going to donate a large amount of money <laughs> to Ukraine who in turn would pay you your salary? Sure. And, and by the way, th th this isn't this isn't speculating. This has happened in history before. That 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 we we actually did this, right? And um, you know, and, and you're going to basically be mercenaries fighting for for Ukraine, um, and you'd still get paid your salary, but through a different way, and blah blah blah, and this and that. And I, I would tell you, there's a lot of soldiers in the Baltics and Poland that really don't like Russia, right? Right. They all hate so that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Right. And and so you you could build a pretty big manpower base. But, I, you know, this is going to take, again, some political leadership that's going to have to go back to your point with Joe Biden, where he said, we don't know what you know, I'm with you to the end. That doesn't that the, it, it, this isn't a marriage. Right. It's not it's not a marriage agreement. I, I don't I don't know. That's not a strategy. I mean, I love my wife and our marriage is a strategy like we 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 do more than just say I'm with you to the end. Right. But, um, but I think I, I gave someone else this example right on F-16s because F-16s really infuriate me. I, if, you know, if people go look at the Kiev Post article that I wrote today. You'll find me. I'm a provider there. And I've written last year. I wrote four articles on the F-16 and why I thought the F-16 was important. And nothing happened for a year. Right. But I worked in the Pentagon for seven years. You, you, you kind of know this. Right. And I was. I know that in the Pentagon, when you're in the Air Force and there's something important to the chief of staff or to the president of the United States, they create a thing called the Tiger Team, right? That <laughs> we're going to make a Tiger Team and they're going to pull together mm -hmm. all the action officer experts and they're basically going to slap basically four star general stars on them and say, dude, you have my stars, go make it happen. Make it happen. Right. Yep. Yeah. And I did this for the MQ1 and the MQ9 back in, in 2006, right? Oh, cool. So I was the MQ1, MQ9 dude who basically built three squadrons out of nothing. I had, I had tons of resources. I had money. I had manpower. I had, I had general support. I was mm -hmm. briefing. It was great. I felt like a King Kong, right? Yeah. W where's the Tiger team on F-16s going to Ukraine? There is I mean, one. if it, there, there isn't one, right? That, that's the point, right? So, so again, you can, you can keep saying all the things that politicians say, not you personally. I don't, this, isn't a you, this isn't a you, you. It's a sure. hyperbole you, right? Jo the administration could keep saying all the things that it's saying, but the actions don't marry up. And, and granted, people who want to believe Joe Biden, look, there's a lot of Democrats that want to believe what he says and say, hey, I don't know. I don't need to know what a tiger team is. I've never heard of these things. I, you know, Jeff, Colonel Fisher, I think you're, you're crazy. Joe Biden says he's going to help. So I believe it. I'm like, well, I'm giving you examples where actions, deeds should match words. And they're just, they're just not. Yeah. Yeah. 
How do you feel about switching theaters real quick to a different theater of conflict? Sure. sure. Let's go good with that. Cool. So let's talk about what's happening inside Gaza with Israel, if you don't mind. Right now, okay. the United States has been calling for a ceasefire. Kamala Harris came out and was like, no, we need a six week ceasefire. Ramadan is coming up. We need to get the hostages out. They need to get exchanged, so on and so forth. And 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 the White House is essentially stance is for several weeks now that a ceasefire is imminent, a ceasefire is imminent, a ceasefire is imminent. It's coming, it's coming, it's coming. And on the flip side, today, as we're recording this inside Cairo, they're holding peace talks or ceasefire talks between Hamas is there and the United States is there, but the key missing component is Israel. Hamas's stance is that the <coughs> only way we're going to agree to a ceasefire is if the IDF complete withdrawals from the Gaza Strip. And Netanyahu just came out and said that they plan on being in Gaza for the next 10 years. What, where is the White House getting this? Like, wh- how do they figure? It, 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 to me, looking from the outside in, that's two people, one of them that doesn't even care enough to show up to the talks and plans on being there for 10 years, and the other side has such a hard stance. Ceasefire is just, it's a dream that'll never happen. Wow. Wow. Yeah, so I'm going to try and approach this from the most neutral position because this is a really polarizing war sure. in, the, in the United States, and right? We're specifically talking about the ceasefire, though, you know? And- right, yeah, 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 yeah. And, and, and if you're, of course, if you're for Gaza, you want to get the ceasefire. If you're for Israel, like, no, you know, I'm, I don't want a ceasefire, right? So I, 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 realize, I realize where listeners are going to fall on this. I'm not, not obtuse to that. So um, I am not an Israel history uh, expert. And I, I, I did not stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night. So I'm, gonna, <laughs> I'm going to try and stick to just the merits of modern warfare uh, on what's going on. Uh, when was the last, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you some questions, see how you do, right? So when was the last time there was a war that ended with an unconditional surrender? World War II. Right. Right. And since World War II, Germany like came around. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Same thing in the Civil War. We had an unconditional surrender. Like, sure. you, right. So Lincoln basically said when when the South was losing, they kept coming to him saying, hey, let's talk. Mm-hmm. No, dude, they're, 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 you, don't, you don't get to bring stipulations to me. I'm winning. Right. right. I'm, I'm right. winning. And, and we did the same thing in World War Two. Correct. I will give you, and, and you and I can name numerous examples where we had wars that ended with conditional surrender. Mm-hmm. Kosovo, um, Desert Storm One, Desert Storm Two. Uh, you know, w- which which ones of the wars that I just mentioned are still problems that we're facing today? Kosovo, All of them. Iraq, <laughs> right? And the reason is, no matter how good of diplomats and lawyers you have to draw up a conditional ceasefire and peace agreement each side hears what it wants to hear sure it reads it the way it budapest memorandum we go all the way back to the beginning oh, of right, our yeah. side, right? <clears throat> right each side gets to hear what they want to hear right and then a year later like no no, no that doesn't mean that it means this sure right i i realize there's a lot of people upset with Israel continuing and moving forward and refusing to find a ceasefire uh, or a or, or some kind of pe- you know moderated peace agreement but i also understand that Israel has been under attack for so long that conditional peace agreements for them are no longer acceptable it has to be an unconditional surrender and 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 to be fair I don't think Bibi Netanyahu has used those words because they, they'd be distasteful politically right sure. now, right? I mean, he's so, out but said I, that Hamas is not going to exist after this. He said that that's, that's their... He said that, right. But, but I think this, to him, this has to be an unconditional surrender. You cannot be Gaza and bringing stipulations to the table in that, in that surrender agreement. And right. to be fair, look, wars have ended like that. Like I said, Germany... And Japan ended the war in World War II on unconditional surrender. And at the end of the day, look, Germany and, and Japan still exist, right? So they can th- – th- th- there's a chance that something in Gaza can exist, but it has to be able to respect the, the sovereignty and independence of Israel, just like Japan and Germany had to respect all their other neighbors and stuff like that and move forward. Sure. 
And I, I, I think the one part that actually kind of bothers me about it is, I believe it was last week, Iran gave the green light to Hezbollah and said, look, if Israel goes into Rafah in southern Gaza, you've got the green light to attack. Like, get after it, go after it. I think Israel is about the only country on the face of the earth that actually has the balls to launch a full-on assault on an area like that during Ramadan, knowing the political and, you know, religious implications of it and what's going to happen. And you've been, on, <clears throat> you've been on the ground in the Middle East. You fought in the Middle East. Um, and you also have been involved, I'm sure, during a period of Ramadan while you were over there. And so I don't have That's to horrible. tell you, you also know that the way they think is totally different than how anybody else does. And when I say they, I'm talking about Islamic extremists, um, particularly like the Hamas fighters. And I saw even when I was in Afghanistan during Ramadan or in Iraq, people that would just pretty much commit themselves to dying, you know, and, and attempt to fight you so that they could get a better place in heaven, regardless of the fact that they're starving and that they haven't eaten or drinking anything all day and they'll just go after it. So I don't see that turning out very well. And I just see those numbers increasing and looking horribly politically. So my question for you, when you look at it, are, are you concerned that Israel is going to like, do you think Israel has the capacity during Ramadan to actually go and launch assault on Rafa? And at the same time, I think they would have to go in to Lebanon and attack Hezbollah preemptively because they have over 100,000 fighters split between, you know, Lebanon and Syria in order to protect their own border. Yeah, I, I don't think Ramadan is the issue to it's not an issue that that, you know, Netanyahu is really cared about. And, and look, I, I get to the point where I, I have a hard time believing anything that's coming out of either side without having neutral players on the ground anymore. And I, I it's a really jaded position to be and I get it right. But I mean, I I watched the United States go in with these food drops and these MREs. Right. And the first right. thing I, you know, I, I, I go on Twitter today or X and I. I see people complaining that the food's not hala and it's got Tabasco sauce in it. And I'm like, you know, as, as a ground commander of Afghanistan, if, if my troops were complaining about the type of food, I was good. It's right? a good thing because if, they're fed. Because, <laughs> because, because, because it's not that they're hungry. They just want something different, right? That they're, they're, If they're saying it's not enough, I need more, that, then That's I worry, is, right? Because it's, yeah, then it's Napoleon, right? That uh, An army marches on its stomach. So you, it's hard for me to believe that the guys in Gaza are hungry if they're complaining about the type of the food, right? So are there some people starving? Yes, it's absolutely bad. I, did, I, I don't dismiss that. I think that you know Hamas did take a lot of the food and they ate and they want to give it to the fighters. And, 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 and that's not uncommon. People make it sound like it's a horrible thing. It's not uncommon. If you know about North Korea, right? If you're, mm -hmm. if you're a soldier, you get, you get a lot more rice in your family, yeah. right? Than if, you, if you're just a regular North Korean, you, you don't get as much, right? And that, it, leaders do this, right? So, um, yeah, I, I, I don't think Ramadan's the issue. I, I, I think that they're just going to keep pressing. I think if, Netanyahu's, if Netanyahu is frustrated, what I think he's frustrated with is his military leaders because he wants it to go faster. Because sure. every day that passes by is one more PR nightmare that he has to deal with until this thing ends, right? So he wants it done. He would Faster and funnier is kind of his – not funny. That, that's probably a poor pun, right? But, but faster and funnier is kind of how he wants it to happen. Sure. And, you know, like when you talk about the PR nightmare, we you've dealt with this crap on the ground and so have I. PR is always at the forefront of like U.S. policies when we're operating in other countries, particularly in wartime and making sure that we're putting on the right face. And I feel like that's just one place that Israel has failed at is the PR nightmare that is the Gaza Strip. And it's not just Israel's fault. You also have Egypt, you know, that could be opening up their borders. If they're like the Sinai Peninsula, for example, is nothing but a massive freaking prison, you know, like you don't have to put up borders out there. Uh, I mean, you would, but regardless at the end of the day, you know, the airdrops are great. That, that, that looks great on the international stage and everything else, but all of that is going to fall short the moment they go into Rafa. And I, I think they're going to get slaughtered politically on the international stage when they do that. Yeah, they, 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 they probably will. Right. Um, but I would also say this, even, even if, you know, Israel opened up its, its MOD and said, I'm going to bring in a, a neutral staff to just watch how we do our targeting process to, to say, well, okay, this is the video that came down. We have real time intelligence. Yes, that's a mosque. We know that there's leaders in there. We know there's caches. We've got a, a UAV flying over. And yet all that being the world we live in today with, with social media, 
immediately they're just going to go and attack and discredit these neutral observers. Yeah, they're going to write it and off. Then, so, it does, so, so if you're Israel, why would you even take the chance to put neutral observers in there when these neutral observers could actually be guys that are making moments like they get, get out of the mosque, right? So, mm-hmm. yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, kinda, I see both sides. That's kind of how I viewed it is that like they're damned if they do and they're damned if they don't. They're going to lose the PR campaign either way. Just because the amount of people on social media that are pouring disinformation, misinformation out left and right, Israel's going to lose the PR campaign either way because as far as one side goes, they're not going to believe a word that comes out. And on the other side, you have nobody's going to believe a word that they say. And so it's really left to, I'm going to be, as you stated earlier, negotiating from position of advantage, you know, like civil war. Mm -hmm. No, you know, the union's not going to hear it because we're crushing them. You know, same thing in World War II. It, once you get to that position of advantage, you don't have to worry about it. And I feel like Israel f- knows it's in a position of advantage. And regardless of what the international community says, they're just going to keep going because they can. It's not like the yeah, UN is going to go in and stop yeah. them. Yeah, you, you need a Truman. You need a Churchill. You need a Lincoln. And to be fair, there's a lot of things to be said that Bibi's not a great guy, but he, he's he's got that kind of leadership mindset. He's ready to go, right? And and there could be questions in a press conference like, why are you doing that? And he'd be like, I don't, I don't care what you say. I'm doing it. Right. And, <laughs> right. and that would be how tr- that would have, be how Truman would answer. or That would be how Churchill would answer. And, and I would tell you that I don't see that in Macron. I don't see that in Biden. I don't see that in Mm-mm. in the current UK leader. I, I can't think of his name right now. I, 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 it fails me. But I, I don't see it in a lot of Western leaders. I don't see that. Macron's got a little hint of it. Right. With this whole bit, idea yeah. that he's going to send troops. But I think France is an, an anomaly, right? France is the one nation that like literally lost itself in World War II. You got a picture of Hitler standing in front of the, you right. know, the Eiffel Tower in Paris. You know, French know what it's like to potentially not have France anymore, right? So, yeah. Yeah. So one last thing I wanted to pick your brain about before <laughs> before I let you go and give your final statement or anything. You brought up North Korea, and it was a talking point that I wanted to get on with you um, earlier when we were talking about Ukraine, but I still want to address it now anyways. So North Korea um, provided about one and a half million artillery shells into Ukraine. And reports are coming off the front line right now that are stating that about 50% of the artillery shells that are being shot into Ukraine are failing um, from the Russian side. I.e., The shells that came out of the DPRK don't work. About 50% of them don't. What I read on it was a lot of the shells that the DPRK had provided to Russia were from the 70s, 80s, 90s time frame. And when I was in Afghanistan, we ended up getting a shipment of ordnance, for lack of better terms, um, that we needed. And it was all old. We're talking mortar rounds, hand grenades, everything else. And they have, if I remember right, it was like every 10 years is stamped on the crate for the inspection. And we had <laughs> a very similar failure rate. Now, I understand that artillery shells versus, you know, a mortar rounds are two completely different things when we look at it. But it wasn't the fact that they failed to fire is the fact that they failed to detonate. Do you think that even like, I know artillery is huge in North Korea, right? It's like one of the main things that they're always looking at um, when it comes to deterring South Korea and everything else. But how do you feel about that figure that you, the Ukraine had put out that 50% of those munitions failed? Because in my opinion, when you start looking at that, plus the reports from the front line of Russians are assaulting without artillery support on top of the casualty numbers and everything else, I, I interpret that as Russia is kind of out of steam. You know, that that they have ran their course, took a huge hit. They tried, but they're starting to run out of steam. Yeah. So if you have millions and millions of artillery shells from the 70s and 80s in your nation that has basically in a Cold War, <coughs> excuse me, you have two things, you two have two options, right? You can start a war and use them, mm-hmm. or you'd be wise to decommission them. Keeping them is a really bad idea. That is option three, and that's clearly what they did. I would tell you nations that make choices like that, um, and look, Arm, you, you know full well, right, that uh, you had a situation, and 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 I, look, I, my logistics officer, battalion commander on the ground, right, he come to me and he's like, sir, we just got this shipment, and look at look at these stamps on where they just look kept saying crap. this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right? And so, like, holy, you know, you send that back. Um, look, Here's a perfect example. This is another example that that we could use right under the current administration. So the United the United States has about a hundred expired ATACMs, right? Mm-hmm. They've they're 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 past their shelf life. They they just expired, mm-hmm. and we've already paid and built new ones. So that the new ones are already out there. They're operational. Yep. 
under U.S. law, the expired ones cannot be on any combat commander's war plans, right? You can't you can't plan to use expired stuff. Right. <laughs> That's against the law. Sure. So we we could give freshly expired ATACMs, but the United States Army and some of its brass is they said, no, 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 don't give those. We're gonna we're gonna do a a refit of these things. We'll look at them. We're gonna do an inspection. We're gonna see if they're still good. And if they're inspection, we're gonna slap a sticker on them, give them another ten years, and extend them. And I was like, mm, that that's just it's just a it's bad policy, right? They'd be wiser to actually spend the money, decommission them, get them out of the inventory, because look, Congress expects the failure rates of ATACMs to be on the order of single digit percentages. Right. That that's what they expect. Mm-hmm. When you're briefing Congress to say, we have two hundred ATACMs, they're like, okay, so ATACMs only maybe two to three percent failure rate. That's great. The the generals in the army don't go, no, 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 Congressman. A hundred of those were from the old time we stamped them yeah, probably yeah, at no, 10 to they- 15%. They they be like, Yeah, thanks, General. That's great, right? They're yeah. like, I'm gonna get away from here. I'm great. I'm 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 fine. So no, I I, I don't like that attitude. So I, I'm I agree with you, right? I, it, it it's frustrating. Yeah, it's. It, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I just I don't see things turning out amazing, but I also look at it and I say, okay, the front line is going to be here. And kind of, I guess, my prediction for it going forward, and I've had this stance for a while, is this is going to essentially end inside Ukraine is something like we're seeing between North and South Korea. Like you said, there hasn't been an unconditional surrender in a really long time. If you argue, you argue from a position of advantage. Russia clearly isn't steamrolling across Ukraine right now. And so they're not really in a position to negotiate with Ukraine. And Ukraine's not really in a position to negotiate with Russia. And that essentially leaves somewhat of a ceasefire agreement in place. And that's kind of how I see it going down. Basically, a DMZ stretching across eastern Ukraine. And, and to be fair, you're 100% correct. This, isn't, this is not uncommon for Russia, right? Russia has DMZ equivalents, two of them, in Georgia, regions called South Ossetia and Abkhazia, right? So they, these have become Russian territories that, sure. were, that were formerly Georgia. Georgia wants them back. They don't recognize these as independent or part of Russia. You've got Transnistria and Moldova, which has <laughs> right. now claimed it wants to be Russia. You've, and, and you've got you know the, the land that was originally between Armenia and Azerbaijan called Nagorno-Karabakh, which that now has been taken away. However, there's still kind of a frozen conflict there between those two that basically Russia has instigated. So this is, you're 100% correct. This is modus operandi. Right. Mm -hmm. For Putin, he's completely okay with a DMZ type scenario with many of his of his nations. Right. Good. Good walls build good neighbors. So, yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it's it's insane to think that all those lives ultimately end in a DMZ. It's nuts. Yeah. Yep. Yep. It's nuts. Wow. Well, Jeff, any any final words or thoughts? That's about all the questions I had for you. I made it through the list. I didn't I didn't stumble (laughs) once. That's great. No, I, I really appreciate it. Uh, and and again, I, I'm I'm glad to come back. This time, I actually put my books behind me for your no, uh, for your guys out it. there. So so for anyone who wants to buy my books, I'd love that. I I I, uh, I make a little bit of a living off that. It's really nice, right? It puts food in my kids' mouth. And then the other thing is, uh, what I would ask your listeners, I, I really appreciated the comments that I saw last time. So if you if you do if you do choose to go out and read my article, I would ask you if you could throw it out on your social media and just say, hey, this guy's kind of got a an interesting take. I'd appreciate it. So yeah, of course, I'm going to do it myself as well. I mean, I'm not as, awesome. Thanks not as big a name on Twitter as you are, but uh, I, I really uh, think I match you on Instagram, which it's a different cesspool. But <laughs> you're young. You're, you're you're in that game, man. I'm too old for it. I'm too old for Instagram. I, 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 I feel weird when I get into Instagram. I'm too old, man. Yeah, I can't spend any real time on Instagram. Like it just, <laughs> I can't do it. Like I go on there, I'll make a post, I'll check my messages, and I'll move on with life. But yeah, IG is just, okay, yeah. it's a whole other cesspool. It, it Twitter is yeah. its own cesspool. Everything's its own cesspool these days. Yeah, I'm with you. Anyway, it's great to be on your show, man. I appreciate it. No, thank you for coming by. All right. Have a great day. You too. So I want to give a special thanks for Colonel Fisher coming on the show and give us his insight. If you guys haven't seen his article, I'll also link that down in the description below. Go give him a check out. And if you want, go read some of his books. They're available on Amazon. And I've got those also linked in the description below. And just so you're aware, we also have discussed about bringing him back on for a third part. And it's going to be something that you guys are going to be very interested in. I'll just leave it at that. Until next time, ladies and gentlemen, peace, love, happiness, God bless. I am out of here.